In John chapter 18, the ruler and the judge of all the earth was standing trial for his life. Pontius Pilate was questioning Jesus about why the Jews would want to put him to death. And in verse 37, Pilate asked Jesus if he really did consider himself to be a king. And Jesus responded with a remarkable declaration. You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate heard Jesus' emphasis on the truth, and he responded with a question. Perhaps he was asking rhetorically or dismissively, but he was certainly asking incredulously. John 18, 38, what is truth? It may not be an exaggeration to say that no one has ever asked a more fundamental question than that. What is truth? In every era of human history, people have wrestled with the nature of the truth, and rightly so, necessarily so. The truth speaks not merely of that which is true, but the standard itself by which all claims are measured. The concept of truth is absolutely foundational to the concept of knowledge itself. What we know as well as how we know what we know, depends on our understanding of the nature of the truth. The truth is what distinguishes the genuine from the counterfeit. Is this a true $100 bill or is it a fake? It's what separates fact from fiction. Is this a true story or is it just a myth? It's what separates reality from fantasy. Is this truly happening or am I dreaming? It even separates the moral from the immoral. Is this the truth or is it a lie? In Pastor John's book, The Truth War, he writes, Every idea we have, every relationship we cultivate, every belief we cherish, every fact we know, every argument we make, every conversation we engage in, and every thought we think, presupposes that there is such a thing as truth. The idea is an essential concept without which the human mind could not function. And yet, as fundamental as the truth is to every aspect of human thought, there has been historically and there is today widespread confusion regarding the very notion of truth itself. Three different approaches to the concept of truth characterize three broad epochs of history. In the era of pre-modernism, which spans from the beginning of civilization through the mid-17th century, it was generally accepted that truth could be known and that any truth that was known was given by divine revelation, whether from the true God of the Bible or any combination of the false deities from the pantheons of the pagans, pre-modern peoples believed that only a being with knowledge that transcended human limitations could reliably reveal objective truth to mankind. The era of modernism, which runs from about 1685 to 1989, was spawned by the so-called enlightenment of the 16th in 17th centuries. There were great strides being made in scientific discovery and man's understanding of the natural world, and the result was that mankind became overly impressed with his own intellect. Philosophical advances caused thinkers to become skeptical of religious claims, skeptical of the reliability of the Scriptures, skeptical of even the very existence of God. Reason replaced religion, and philosophical rationalism demanded the rejection of claims that couldn't be squared with the reasoning of modernity. The test of truth became whether it was rational, whether it made sense, which is a good canon as far as it goes. The problem is 
when it's divorced from the Bible and subjected to the natural fallen human mind, it leaves no room for the supernatural claims of the Gospels. A virgin-born, miracle-working, prophecy-fulfilling Savior who bore the sins of His people by His substitutionary death and who rose bodily on the third day simply could not surmount the bar of naturalist rationalism. And then into the 19th century, further scientific advancements along with the Industrial Revolution gave birth to positivism, which was a form of empiricism that held truth could be known through the scientific method. If we design well-run experiments and if we make the proper uh, observations and inferences on the basis of the data, we can know what is true. In short, modernism held that man was able to discern truth for himself through what he could observe with his senses and what he could understand by his reasoning. But the 19th century's unbounded optimism in mankind's limitless potential was followed by the bloodiest century in the history of the world. Two world wars, the consistent threat of nuclear destruction, and the emergence of several dictators throughout the world provided a more realistic view of human nature. All the philosophical and scientific advances of the Enlightenment, uh, all of the innovation of the Industrial Revolution only led to devastation and suffering. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, typified by the tearing down of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, the modernist era gave way to what has been called postmodernism. Pre-modernism held that truth could be known by divine revelation. Modernism held that truth could be known by rigorous testing of the natural world and making rational deductions. Postmodernism is doubtful that absolute truth can be known at all. Now, some versions of postmodern thought allow for the existence of objective truth, but they rather dogmatically reject the notion that human beings can arrive at such truth with any certainty. They're quite certain that no one can be certain of anything. Sure, there may be truth out there somewhere, but it's far beyond our ability to comprehend. Then there's another stripe of postmodernism that's become increasingly popular, which asserts, again, rather certainly, that absolute truth does not exist at all, and that all truth claims boil down to mere opinions. And in these days of critical theory and cultural Marxism, it's become common to say that anyone claiming to speak truth amounts to persons from privileged groups aiming to impose their opinions and preferences upon marginalized groups so that the privileged oppressor classes can preserve their own power and influence over the oppressed. Illustrations of the postmodernist rejection of the truth are ever present. A couple of years ago, a conservative apologetics ministry produced a video series called Road Trip to Truth, and they traveled to local university campuses and interviewed college students about their views on truth and morality and authority. And then they invited Christian professors and theologians to offer biblical responses to the students' claims. <clears throat> And though they asked these students questions on a variety of topics, there was one question they asked everyone, whether they believed that absolute objective truth exists. And almost every one of them said, no. You may have your truth, but I have my truth. And if my truth contradicts your truth, how could either of us be so arrogant and oppressive as to claim that one of us must subject our truth to the other one's truth. One young man who was interviewed even said, quote, anything can be true, even a lie, if enough people believe in it. Now, that is not consistent with reality, but it is consistent with postmodernism's rejection of absolute truth. And that, of course, is to say that postmodernism is not consistent with reality. If there is no objective standard by which we can measure truth claims, 
both morality and reality descend into pure subjectivism, and the result is absurdity. If we can't say that there's an objective standard by which to judge an action to be truly good or evil, well, then morality itself is denigrated into nothing more than competing personal preferences. It's popular today for people to say that morality is subjective and socially constructed. Certain societies sort of socially contract in agreement upon certain things that are virtues and other things that are vices, but what falls into which category differs among culture to culture and across time. But if that were true, and if morality were subjective and socially constructed, by what consistent standard could we condemn the evils of chattel slavery or the Holocaust or race-based segregation laws? Were not the societies of antebellum America, Nazi Germany, and the Jim Crow South living their truth? If truth were nothing other than a social contract, whereby members of a particular society simply decide to live as if certain values are right and others are wrong, who are we to tell the Nazis that their culture was wrong? Wouldn't that be us arrogantly trying to force our worldview and moral standards upon others? If there were no such thing as absolute truth, we couldn't consistently say it is absolutely true that it is always wrong to kidnap people and enslave them as if they were property. No, oh, the most a consistent postmodernist could say is, well, I find race-based chattel slavery to be unpleasant, and I don't think it should be allowed, but I can't say that it's always wrong in all cultures. It could be morally right if enough people agree that it's right. Now, you see, no clear-thinking person would ever dream of saying such a thing. It is absolutely true that slavery, the Holocaust, and segregation were moral evils for every society, no matter what the majority agreed upon. But you see, when a consistent application of your worldview prohibits you from denouncing such obvious wrongdoing as objectively evil, your worldview has been proven wrong can't account for reality. And that's where I'm going next. The postmodern theory of truth not only upends morality, but reality itself. Matters of fact are reduced to mere opinions. Well, sure, you believe the Bible, but I believe the Quran or the Talmud or the Bhagavad Gita. Well, yes, I understand that we believe different things, but it doesn't matter what we believe it matters whether what we believe is true. Well, but we can both be right. Well, no, we can't both be right because we're making mutually exclusive truth claims. And if mutually exclusive truth claims can both be right, well, then we would transgress a fundamental axiom of all rational thought, the law of non-contradiction which states that a truth claim, let's call it A, and the negation of that truth claim, call it not A, cannot both be true at the same time and in the same relationship. The law of con non-contradiction is that A and not A cannot both be true at the same time and in the same relationship. And if that is not a sound principle of thought, we lose all rational basis for knowledge and nothing means anything. If you are listening to this sermon and you are not listening to this sermon can both be true at the same time and in the same sense, then there's no logical, consistent logical basis for either statement. If the statement, even a lie can be true, is true, then that statement can be a lie and there's no reason to believe it. You see, thought and communication are rendered impossible. The claim, there is no absolute truth, is itself an absolute statement. There's as much rational basis for using words to say, I don't believe in words. Right? Saying it proves that it's false. My favorite question to ask those who say there's no absolute truth is, is it absolutely true that there is no absolute truth? 
See, because if it is absolutely true that there is no absolute truth, then there is absolute truth. And if it's not absolutely true that there's no absolute truth, then there is absolute truth. If the claim is true, it's false. <clears throat> now, of course, not everybody who makes these self-defeating arguments openly embraces the absurd conclusions that necessarily follow from them. The point is simply this, that when a consistent application of your worldview leads you to the absurd denial of reality or to self-defeating and self-contradictory claims, it's a surefire indication that your worldview has failed, that it's false. And that is where our society lives right now. The choice has always been the God of the Bible or absurdity. And our culture has long ago rejected the triune God of the Bible, and they are coming down to the end of the slide of absurdity. The consistent outworking of that rejection of God was the choice of the absurd, of self-contradiction, of fantastical denial of reality. And at the present time, there is no greater popular level illustration of postmodernism's descent into absurdity than the transgender movement. There is no more brazen denial of reality than to suggest that a man can be a woman if he feels like it. Not long ago, the notion of a pregnant man was a comedic fantasy. Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger made a movie about it in 1994. It was called Juniors. Schwarzenegger gets pregnant. Everybody understood it was make-believe. We all laughed at it, like Santa Claus. Today, just 30 years later, if you deny that a man can get pregnant, you're a transphobic bigot who should be banished from the public square, who should lose your job, and who should not be welcomed into polite society. When the newest Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson was being interviewed for the position by Congress, she was asked whether she could give a definition of the term woman, sort of relevant for a judge interpreting laws that have to do with women's rights and civil rights and all these things. And, so she, and she said she couldn't because she wasn't a biologist. Well, what is that but the consistent application of the denial of the absolute truths of basic biology. In fact, in a recent documentary called What is a Woman, a, a conservative commentator interviews several people who have embraced transgender ideology seeking an answer to that very question. Well, if you can just be a woman if you feel like it, what is a woman then? And during uh, one interview with a gender studies professor, this interviewer says he wants to, quote, get to the truth. And the professor responds, I'm really uncomfortable with that language. It sounds deeply transphobic to me. And then he threatens to stop the interview, saying, you keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. See, truth is inimical to those who wish to embrace absurdity and deny reality. And they recognize it. You keep talking about truth, we're going to stop the interview. But you see, it's not the case that truth is transphobic. It's that trans is truthphobic. And why, why is our society so eager to embrace transgenderism? You ever ask yourself that question? It's not as if there's a huge transgender constituency in the United States of America. The entire LGBTQ population in America is still estimated to be only a little over 7%. Why is the transgender cause part of the Democratic Party platform when it embraces only 1% to 2% of all Americans? Our society is so eager to embrace transgenderism because it is so eager to deny the absolute truth and objective standard of morality that are incompatible with transgenderism, that relegate it to the realm of the delusional, and condemn it as immoral. And why would that be? Paul writes in Romans 1.18 that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against sinners who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
You see, truth has been sufficiently revealed to mankind. Romans 1.19, God made it evident to them. Romans 1.20, his attributes have been clearly seen through creation so that men are without excuse. And so if they were to admit that there is an objective standard of truth, they would be forced to admit that every one of us is accountable to the God of truth whose law condemns them for their own sins, whatever those sins may be. And so they suppress the truth of the very existence of truth. They think, well, if there's, a, if there's an absolute standard by which transgender perversion is judged to be immoral, well, there's an absolute standard by which my perversion, whatever it is, is judged to be immoral. I'm accountable to the God whose law sets that standard. And they say, no, 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 that can't be. Uh, Sure, men can be women, anything you want, just so that I can sin in peace without the pangs of a conscience informed by the Word of God. Jesus explains this phenomenon in John 3, 19 to 21. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and that men loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Why? For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. People reject the truth, both that which is true and the standard of truth itself, not for intellectual reasons, but for moral reasons. Pastor John says, sinners love their sin, so they flee from the light, denying that it even exists. Now, of course, straight talk like this is no longer tolerated. The the culture that castigates you for not being tolerant of drag queen story hour simply will not tolerate being told the truth. It's derided as unloving. And anything that is unloving is violently opposed to the ethic of Jesus, who preached that love was to be his followers' cardinal virtue. Love is love, they shouted us, rather unlovingly. Well, yes, love is love. But love, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth which means that a culture that revels in unrighteousness and rejects even the existence of truth can have absolutely no idea what love is. Love and truth are inextricably bound together. They're bound in the nature of God himself. Exodus 34, 6, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. They're bound inextricably in the Christian's life of conformity to Christ-likeness, Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love, literally, but truthing in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. They're bound inextricably as the sphere in which the Christian life exists, 2 John verse 3 Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. You can't separate love from truth. And any society that rejects the truth will inevitably find itself in chaos. And one telltale sign of such chaos is celebrating hatred as if it were love and calling good evil and evil good, Isaiah 5.20. What do I mean? I mean that homosexuality and transgenderism are soul-destroying perversions. If not repented of, they end in eternal punishment. And so affirming or celebrating or even refusing to warn against such sins is evidence of the most malicious kind of hatred, not love. We love like Jesus loves, when we warn of sin's mortal danger and proclaim the gospel of the truth by which sinners can be rescued from that danger. And so I say to you, dear people, don't be deterred 
from issuing those warnings and proclaiming that gospel because of accusations, well, that you're just so full of hate. It should be no surprise to us that a culture that has no idea what love is also has no idea what hate is and sees the loving act of truth-telling as hatred. When you reject the truth, you accuse as hateful those who would dare disturb your delusion. So what do we do with all of that? We live in this world that is under God's judgment to such a degree that they've been given over to a reprobate mind, a mind that doesn't function, to such a degree that they've embraced the failed worldview of postmodernism, have denied reality, and descended into absurdity. So what? Well, it's not enough, friends, to diagnose the problem. It's not enough to accurately discern it. It's not enough to lament it or decry it or mock it and long wistfully for the good old days. And yet neither is the proper course to coddle postmodernism's uneasiness with the truth by toning down the definitive and right-angled claims of the biblical worldview by trying to compromise in order to contextualize the gospel to a culture that has set itself against the very fundamentals of knowledge and rational thought. No, the proper response is not to compromise with the culture, nor to retreat from the culture. The proper response is to boldly confront the culture by unashamedly proclaiming the truth of biblical Christianity. We are here in 2024, friends, to be the salt of the earth. We are here to be that preserving and seasoning influence upon a world that is rotting and decaying. We are here in 2024 to be the light of the world. We are to shine forth the light of the truth into a world that is lost in darkness. And salt that isn't salty is useless. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. We need to be equipped to engage these errors with the word of the living God. And so let us resolve to be salt and light to this dying culture by graciously and yet boldly confronting the lies with the truth of Christ and Him crucified. And that starts by considering how supremely central the concept of truth is for the Christian worldview, especially against the backdrop of a society that has rejected truth altogether. And in an effort to do that, I want us to consider, for the rest of the time we have this evening, five pillars of the truth of the Christian worldview. Five pillars of the truth of the Christian worldview so that we might be able to sound forth to the world a clear answer to Pilate's question, what is truth? First, consider the value of truth. So far from finding the truth to to be offensive or rude or condescending, Absolute truth is essential to the Christian worldview. What is truth? First, it is inestimably valuable. In Proverbs 23, 23, the sage exhorts those who would gain wisdom to buy truth and do not sell it. See, Christians regard the truth as such a precious treasure that we are to exhaust all lawful means to lay hold of it. And once we've got it, we are to never let it go. Buy truth and do not sell it. By nature, all mankind is born in captivity, enslaved to sin, and doomed to reap its deadly consequences. But John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus says that it's the truth that'll free us from the bondage of sin and death. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You see, without the truth, We lie helpless in our slavery. Just several verses after that in John 8, 44, Jesus says that the truth stands in mortal conflict with Satan. The devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you see, lies are satanic and evil and wicked. Truth, by contrast, stands against such wickedness. Teams are clear, aren't they? Satan and lies on this side, God and the truth on this side. When you hear criticisms of the truth as a concept, 
Guess which team you're hearing that from? It's from the world of darkness. And as a result, then, to stand against the truth is to court the wrath and indignation of God. In Romans 2, Paul speaks of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. He says in Romans 2, 8, those who do not obey the truth will receive a judgment of, quote, wrath and indignation. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, Paul characterizes followers of Jesus as those who received the love of the truth so as to be saved. So if you are to be saved from sin and the judgment to come, you must be one who loves the truth. And then similar to his comments in Romans, he says, those who don't love the truth will perish under the judgment of God. And so essential is the truth of the Christian worldview that Christ himself summarizes the entire purpose of his incarnation and mission from heaven in terms of the truth. In the verse we began the night with, John 18, 37, Jesus says to Pilate, for this I have been born and for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Who hears the shepherd's voice? John 10, those sheep, who are given to him by the Father, out of whose hand nobody can snatch them. The elect hear the shepherd's voice. And so here's another instance in which the people of God are defined as those who are of the truth. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, 8, truly a text for our times, Paul says of true believers that we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. You know, that that is your motto. Somebody ought to put that on a T-shirt. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. Why can't you just call him the name he wants to be called? Why can't you just use his preferred pronouns? Well, because we can do nothing against the truth. And reinforcing someone's delusion like that is acting against the truth. And then in 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, the church itself is the pillar and support of the truth. It's simply impossible to exaggerate the centrality of the concept of truth with respect to Christianity. From these passages, we could conclude that Jesus and the apostles saw the truth as identical to Christianity itself. But more than the system of Christianity or the Christian worldview, Scripture goes on to identify the truth with the nature of God himself. It brings us to a second point, not only the value of truth, but also, number two, the God of truth. The God of truth. In Psalm 31.5, David prays to God for rescue from his persecutors, and he writes, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Yahweh, God of truth. And Isaiah repeats that title for God in the latter portion of his prophecy. Isaiah 65.16, He who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. He who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth. You see, this is who God is. And so those who are uneasy about the concept of truth are uneasy about God. There is no middle ground. There is no way to be antagonistic to the idea of truth without also being antagonistic to the idea of the God of the universe. I'll put it simply, if you don't like truth, you don't like God. And further than that, since God is a trinity... Since the God the Bible reveals is one God subsisting in three co-equal, consubstantial, and co-eternal persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Scripture identifies each person of the Trinity with the truth. John 7, 28, Jesus speaks of the Father when he says, He who sent me is true. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth incarnate. And even in 1 John 5, 6, we we find the Spirit is the truth. So what is truth? In short, the triune God is the truth. If you speak metaphysically, Yahweh is the one true God, the only genuine God that exists. 
right? The Thessalonians turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. If you were to speak logically, the God of the Bible is incapable of erring or being mistaken. His understanding is infinite, Psalm 147, verse 5. He knows all things as they actually are. And then speaking ethically, the triune God is opposed to all lies and duplicity and deceit. He is, Titus 1, 2, the God who cannot lie, who is perfectly and unfailingly faithful, whose faithfulness reaches to the skies. The Dutch Reformed theologian Herman Bavink wrote, God is the truth in its absolute fullness. He, he therefore, is the primary, the original truth, the source of all truth, the truth in all truth. What is truth? Truth is that which is consistent with the mind of the triune God of truth. And the culture is in chaos because its people have rejected this God from being Lord over them and have exalted themselves in his place. They've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the, cre the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And God has graciously revealed his mind to mankind through his inerrant scriptures, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. And that brings us thirdly to the word of truth, the word of truth. Because God is the God of truth who can't lie, his words, which he has breathed forth in the pages of the Bible by the agency of human authors, those words are pure and unalloyed truth. In 2 Samuel 7, after God gives the Davidic covenant promise, David responds to that revelation by declaring in verse 28, Now, O Lord Yahweh, you are God, and your words are truth. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true individually, every one of them. And then Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your words is truth. Both individually and collectively, we must confess what Jesus says to the Father in John 17, 17, your word is truth. The word of God, the inerrant scriptures, are not merely true as if their content happens to cohere with an external standard of truth. No, as an expression of God's own nature and mind, God's word is truth itself. It is the very standard by which all claims are to be measured. It is, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, the word of truth, which is to be accurately handled by the servants of God who labor in preaching and teaching. And so if anyone desires to know the truth, they must measure every truth claim against the teaching of the Bible. What is truth? Truth is that which is consistent with the Word of God as revealed in the inerrant and sufficient Scriptures. And the culture is in chaos because it has rejected God's unchanging Word and has exalted in its place man's own twisted reasoning and fluctuating feelings. And what is the message of those Scriptures? That brings us, number four, to the gospel of truth. The Bible is the word of truth, but the central message communicated to mankind in the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of forgiveness of sins through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from works. It's the message that although all people have sinned and fall short of the glorious standard of perfection that a holy God demands for fellowship with him, Nevertheless, God the Son took on a human nature so that he could live and die in the place of his people, a people that his Father had given him to accomplish their righteousness and pay for their sins. And then having risen from the dead in victory, he welcomes all to lay hold of forgiveness through repentant faith in him alone. And I say to you who are here this evening who yet remain a stranger to the grace of Christ. Today is the day to turn away from your sin. 
to turn away from the absurdity and the fruitlessness of a failed worldview, of a fantasy world, and to trust with your whole heart in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ for the rescue from the just judgment of God. Repent and trust in Christ and be saved this evening. This message, this gospel of your salvation is called in Ephesians 1.13, the message of the truth. In Psalm 69.13, David speaks of the, quote, saving truth of God. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul speaks twice of the truth of the gospel. And in Colossians 1, 5, and 6, he says the gospel is that word of truth that bears fruit throughout the world. One more, James 1, 18 says that the same word of truth, the gospel, is what brings sinners forth out of death unto spiritual life. And I can't resist the comment that that gospel of truth is exclusive. The apostles declare in Acts 4.12 that there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. And that makes sense with John 14.6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. This means that every other proposed way to God, every other religion, or philosophy, or way of life in the history of the world stands opposed to the truth. Christ alone is the door of the sheep. All others, he says, are thieves and robbers. What is truth? Truth is that which is consistent with the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And the culture is in chaos because it has rejected that wonderful news. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Now, to say that the truth is what corresponds to the mind of God is to say that truth is what corresponds to reality. That's because God, who possesses all knowledge and perfect wisdom, can only know that which is really so. He, he can't be mistaken about things. Sometimes we say that, well, I know it's got to be there. I, I left it there, and it's, it's not really there. You don't really know that it's there because it's not there. You can't know what's false, and God knows all. Reality itself is the result of his universal decree, whereby he has ordained whatsoever has, uh, comes to pass. And so he can never be deceived or misled, and therefore his mind is identical to reality as, as it is. And that brings us, number five, to the reality of truth, the reality of truth. It means that truth is that which corresponds to reality. Nothing can be true that manifestly contradicts what is real. Now, that is actually called the correspondence theory of truth. And, of course, no text of Scripture explicitly says, well, the people of God must subscribe to the correspondence theory of truth. But it presupposes the correspondence theory of truth on every page. For example, Proverbs 12, 17 says, He who speaks truth tells what is right, but a false witness deceit. What does it mean for a false witness to speak deceitfully? Well, it means he testifies of a version of events which does not comport with reality. He, he claims that Words were spoken that were not spoken, or events took place which didn't take place. His testimony does not correspond with reality, and so it's not the truth. By contrast, the witness who speaks truth tells what is right, which means what? That he reports words and events as they really happened. His testimony of the truth corresponds to reality. Another example comes from Paul's testimony to Festus in Acts 26. As Paul testified to the suffering and resurrection of Christ as predicted in the Old Testament Scriptures, Festus accuses Paul of being insane. Acts 26, 24, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul responds, I am not out of my mind, but I utter words of sober 
truth. You see, a man who's out of his mind mistakes fantasy for reality. He believes things that are not so. But the truth is sharply contrasted with falsehood and fantasy. The truth is sober. The truth is consistent with reality as it is. In a similar fashion, Titus 1.14 says, those who turn away from the truth pay attention to myths and commandments of men. That means that the truth is neither man-made nor mythical. It's divine, and thus it is in accordance with reality as God has made it. And all throughout Scripture, we observe a consistent contrast between the truth and lies. Jeremiah 9, 3, lies and not truth prevail in the land. Romans 1, 25, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Romans 9, 1, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. Ephesians 4, 25, laying aside falsehood, speak truth. It's plain that the biblical authors presuppose the correspondence theory of truth. And so contrary to the claim that anything can be true, even a lie if enough people believe it, the Word of God declares emphatically, 1 John 2.21, that no lie is of the truth. Truth is not variable from person to person or society to society because reality is not variable from person to person or society to society. We all inhabit the same world under the same God who who governs providence by the same inviolable laws of nature and logic. If someone someone doesn't believe in the law of gravity and jumps from a five-story building the effects of gravity will not be suspended because no gravity is his truth. Gravity exists. It's reality no matter who believes it or not. And the truth is the same. God is God and we are not. His moral law as revealed in the Bible is the rule of our lives. If we disobey, we are liable to his judgment. The only way of escape is faith in Jesus Christ. Someone may not believe those facts, but the truth is true no matter who believes it or rejects it. So what is truth? Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And the culture is in chaos because it's rejected reality and exchanged it for subjectivist fantasy and self-determination, self-creation. I am what I feel like I am. Our culture has rejected the truth, not only the truth of the gospel or the truth of the Bible or the truth of God's existence, but they've rejected truth altogether. And the fruit of such a failed, rebellious worldview is the chaos we observe all around us, where people self-identify as cats and where Supreme Court justices can't define what a woman is and in which math professors at, at my alma mater, where I went to my undergraduate, Uh, Math professors say that if you insist that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that, quote, reeks of white supremacist patriarchy. See, our culture has exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and God has given us over to the unbounded lust and impurity that we see in Romans 124. He's given us over to homosexual perversion, which we see in Romans 126 and 27, and he's given us over to a depraved mind that embraces the absurd, Romans 1, 28. But, as our pastor has said, if our society has come under the judgments of Romans 1, we must follow the prescription, the mandate, the commission of Romans 1, and that is the proclamation of the truth of the gospel by which sinners can be saved from divine judgment. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. You see, though the things of the Spirit our foolishness to the natural man. And though the natural man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, nevertheless, God still opens the blinded minds of the unbelieving and shines the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
And he does this by the proclamation of the very word of truth that the unbeliever so hard-heartedly rejects until he doesn't. This is the word that they reject as ridiculous, but when you proclaim it by the very power of the word itself, God comes in power and breaks the hard heart and opens the blind eyes, melts the heart of stone, frees the will, and saves his people. Faith comes not by philosophical speculation, not by cantankerous bickering. Faith comes by hearing the message concerning Christ, Romans 10, 17. And so my plea to you is do not retreat from this, from the chaos of this culture. March right into it. Engage it. Have the hard conversations. Answer the difficult questions. You see, people reject these truths because they think, in part, because they think there's no good answer to their objections. Because by and large, those who call themselves Christians are unequipped to give the answers. And so I say with gentleness and reverence, give the Bible's answers to the lies of the age. Be salt and light. Proclaim the truth, the valuable truth. Proclaim the truth of the God of truth. Proclaim the truth of God's word, the word of truth. Proclaim the gospel of truth in accordance with the reality of truth. This is what God has sent us into the world to do. Let us not be asleep. Let us not gather ourselves into our bubbles. Have those hard conversations and and speak the truth. Let's pray. Father, we recognize the great commission that you have given us, and we recognize that it doesn't take going into foreign lands to be obedient to that commission. We are as in uh, as a foreign of a land in terms of worldview, in terms of philosophy, in terms of thought, as we could ever hope to be. And I pray that you would give us grace to devote ourselves to understanding these things so that we might give an answer for the hope that is, that is in us, that we might answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And I pray that you give us wisdom when that's the proper course and when another course is to, is to be silent and pray. But by and large, Father, give us uh, the love that you have for the lost that we might engage these lies with the truth. We thank you for the truth that it has opened our eyes, that it has saved us through no merit of our own, We look down our noses at no one. We recognize that we are, uh, of all men, the the chief of sinners, the the worst of the worst, as one untimely born. And yet, by your grace, you've, you've given us eyes to see. You've caused us to love the truth as it is incarnate in Christ Jesus and as it is inspired in your word, the Bible. I pray that you would cause us to love the truth even more as the days grow even more evil. And help us to be that that proclaimer, that watchman on the wall, the one that calls out and announces God's judgment upon wickedness and then announces his grace upon sinners through faith in Christ alone. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.